Welcome to Slipper. Uh, the interplay between theory and practice and new methods within both in relation to production and performance of knowledge is the red thread of this year's Sliver lectures. Since Sliver is browsing through discourses in order to expose the vast arena of architectural thought, today we will dive into the discourse at the intersection of theory and aspects of culture or cultural studies. So culture here is understood as the characteristics of everyday existence and knowledge of a particular group of people in a place or time. Therefore, cultures is probably the most appropriate word, considering cultures not as fixed, bounded, stable, and discrete entities, but rather as constantly interacting and changing sets of practices and processes. And I think a key aspect of all of this uh, to remember is that these practices are spatial, they occur in space uh, in a particular way and get some of their meaning from being spatialized. So spatial practice, as the Fabri suggests in his 1991 book, The Production of Space, embraces production and reproduction and the particular locations and spatial sets characteristic to each social formation. In this case, spatial practice embodies a close association between daily reality, daily routine, and urban reality, the roots and networks which link up the places set aside from work, private life, and leisure. So, and Lefebvre continues saying in this book, the space is a product. Uh, the space does produces, uh, sorry, the space does produce, also serves as a tool of thought and of action. In addition of, uh, to being a means of production, it is also a means of control and hence of domination and of power. So in this context, I would like, I am very happy to introduce Peter Mürtebeck, who is uh, today our today's lecturer. Together with Helge Mooshammer, he founded a practice called Think Architecture. Peter Mürtenberg himself operates in the field of cultural studies. Yes, he's a trained psychologist uh, and architect. Uh, he is a professor of visual culture at the Vienna University of Technology. He is the director of the study and research program called Visual Culture at the same institution. He is also a research fellow in the Department of Visual Cultures at Goldsmith, uh, Goldsmith College, University of London. His practice consists of research and writings on art, architecture, and politics. He focuses on the development of theoretical frameworks around the emergence of network ecologies and collab collaborative forms of spatial production vis-a-vis -vis the current dynamic of geopolitical conflict and urban transformation. And all of these phenom phenomena are, have critical impact on the ways we can see and inhabit the spaces we share. So the collaborative thoughts of Think Architecture have been published in a quite impressive series of books and articles. The research projects such as Network Cultures, Other Markets, and The World of Matter have been collaboration, uh, collaborations with a worldwide network of artists, architects, planners, curators, cultural and media scholars to investigate the interaction of architectural practices with resource ecologies, network creativity, global economies, and information, uh, informal, sorry, informal urbanism. Uh, another research project called Data Publics, I think fits perfectly into this uh, big uh, milieu of thoughts and is hopefully tying quite well also into the, today's lecture, which is titled Beyond Architecture on Demand, Rethinking Urban Futures in the Age of so please give a warm welcome, welcome to the panel.
trick by the way in which you now introduce what we have in your series and what you term uh, a rather complex uh, ecology in the outline of the series. What is so interesting about the complexity is the ways in which you've introduced. Is this Do you want to, to move closer to the mic? Sorry. Is that better now? Yeah? Okay, otherwise I'm just... Give me a sign, I'm, I'm trying to, to speak up a little bit if that, that helps. So, the way in which you were introduced in this lecture series, the way in which you're talking about this complexity of uh, ecologies and how architecture is really related, to the manifold challenges in which we are involved in today, one way or another, <clears throat> be it the challenges that you will say with uh, environmental degradation, so climate change, and such issues, but also uh, questions to do with uh, global displacement, the movement of people across the globe, uh, and questions that you've also introduced around the challenges of institutions, changing institutional landscape. Uh, changes say, to do with digitization and data economies coming to mind. So it's, it's a whole set of different issues uh, that we are facing today and for which as architects we need to come up with some answers or perhaps at least with some, with some ideas. And it's such an amount of different issues and complexities that I won't be able of course to address all of these. Okay? Uh, so uh, but see what I think is really an interesting starting point, perhaps, to start this, this conversation, this discussion here, is to think about the ways in which in architecture we've really, I think, moved beyond this ability of parameters that we felt uh, we can easily navigate by, that we can introduce and include in our own architectural vocabulary, uh, with which we've been working all the time, and so there seems to be this manifold changes with necessity that necessitate a, a change in our own system of operations. So in order to address some of the, these challenges that you've lined, uh, lined out and um, you know, provide some, some material that we can discuss about, what I want to do in the next 50, 60 minutes or so is uh, go through some of the recent research material that I've developed and address the entanglement between architecture and some of these issues, some that uh, you brought up. But before, before doing that, actually, I would like to start the talk by focusing on what I consider to be perhaps at the heart of these manifold changes and uh, the sort of dramatic turbulences that we are witnessing today in our engagement with architecture in many different ways, be it as a designer, be it as a practitioner, or be it as a theorist, as a curator, or in some, some other way in which we are we're talking, working with, with architecture. And the, the heart of many or of these manifold changes is what I consider the relationship, the changing relationship between space and knowledge. That's a proposition I'm going to make today. And not to get our heads around what's happening here, I think that we also need to look at some underlying dynamics that have an impact on this chain relationship. And these underlying dynamics have to do with a recalibration of uh, economy and culture. So what I'm going to do is to address these two different uh, relationships, the space knowledge nexus and the economy culture nexus. And in order to, to start doing that, uh, I want to, to talk about architecture in a way in which we've been used to architecture, that is to say architecture is a home of knowledge, architecture is an archive, is a framework for knowledge in different ways. This home of knowledge can be seen in uh, what's perhaps its most radical and undisguised form in Boulet's late 18th century design, which stacks of books from the walls of the gigantic uh, National Library. And you can see that knowledge is literally incorporated in the walls of this megastructure in a way that makes knowledge uh, both, and that's the, the paradoxical gesture perhaps, both if you are really close and intimate, but always almost in a project. And what's interesting for us in our context here is that in police design, knowledge serves as a framework for reflection and debate. That's what we, what we can see up here. 
So this reflection involves different members of society. Not everyone perhaps at that time, but we see sort of distinguished uh, dedicated scholars, we see members of the general reading public. And the goal is, in a way, is the advancement of civil society, the formation of a particular culture of knowledge based on readership and intellectual exchange. That's what we see in, in this picture. So what's shared here is not just pure information, it's not just simply data that's being shared, but what we see being shared here is the commonality of thought. And so an important part of this idea of reflexivity, of knowledge as a shared reflection, is its orientation towards the long term, towards the long term cultural and political projects we want, the orientation towards planning, which is at the heart of the project of modernity and the civic space it constitutes. So this constellation of space and knowledge that we see enacted here is a particular attempt organizing the future with particular social and ethical values and particular demands of govern on governance at its core. Mm. Move on and throughout the past centuries there have been numerous attempts uh, to organize the future around such value projects and architectural design has always played an important part in these endeavors. That's what I've shown this picture of this iconic library building by, by Dominique Perron with its old house and the shape of old books, the bibliothèque uh, François Mitterrand designed in the late 1980s. So if you look at this building today, it's very strange things are going on. I think. It looks as if these, some 30 years after the working operation of the building, it looks in a way almost outdated. Because in our age of e-books, e-learning, of you know, data sharing economies, uh, the design feels somewhat out of touch with the current conditions of how we produce, disseminate, consume, and talk about knowledge. But I think it's not only that, it also seems that developing and sharing knowledge for the common good has taken a backseat in the global economy that is increasingly structured around the profit-driven valorization of knowledge. And this is kind of preparing the ground for what is often uh, called the algorithmic condition of our lives with activities such as data mining, machine learning, uh, predictive analysis, and other forms of uh, engagement with data constituting the key elements of today's political or economic decision making. So perhaps it's data centers, such as Facebook's uh, data facilities, in the northern Swedish city of Lulea that are the embodiment of this new present configuration of knowledge in space. But once a physically linked commonality of thought, one could say what was once an intellectual commons, has given way to a model of knowledge that is at once infinitely distributed, that is distributed in terms of the global audience of users or followers, constituencies if you want and at the same time ultimately concentrated, concentrated in terms of power. So what is at stake here is not knowledge as such, but the extraction and valorization of knowledge in speculative terms. In such environments, knowledge is no longer a framework of reflection and debate that is stabilized by architecture. <coughs> it has become an index of future potential. In other words, architecture is employed here as an instrument to optimize future performance. It's here that we are seeing Manfred de Fuhr's version <coughs> of late modern architecture as an instrument of knowledge, as a means of creative research, as the Fuhr put it. Uh, perverted in the materiality of such hyperscale data, center, da data centers whose number is predicted to increase dramatically in the near future. Now, the problem here well, that is to say, one of the problems, there are many issues, of course, but one of the key problems here is that the more we take such developments for granted, the more we tend to forget that architectural and urban production is not necessarily restricted to optimizing our performance levels, our efficiency and speed at the service of capital. As a result, we have become otherwise increasingly blind to other values that architecture could pursue beyond the logic of capital, and we might lose sight of the fact that the crucial consequence of what Eva Beller, the French sociologist, 
is called uh, financialized evaluation is that life in the present becomes subordinate to an economy of future options. And we can already see that this has dire uh, consequences for the built environment that we are living in. We've entered an age of architecture in which the new economy of knowledge as financialized valuation is increasingly shaping all aspects of our lives. And the key point I want to make in this context here is that architecture is not necessarily destined to be instrumentalized by this development. It can also be a beacon of hope. But for this to happen, the dynamics we're witnessing right now need to be counteracted through the very medium it has taken hold of. In other words, architecture is key to the, to the production of the financialized knowledge economy and it's key to its contestation. Now the question, and this is a question that's pertaining both to theory and practice, is therefore whether we approach architecture simply as an instrument of speculative wealth generation or as a cultural, social and political device, that is to say as a possibility to recalibrate the relationship between space and knowledge in favor of a more democratic production of culture and subjectivity. This is the key question, I think, that we will to need to engage with when starting to think about a renewed relationship between the theory and practice of architecture. And the good news here is that well, we, we, we don't need to start from scratch here. Theory is always conditioned upon the values existing in a particular field. These values provide the basis for any kind of measurement applied through theory. Questions like, what counts as a value of design? What's a suitable spatial solution in a particular context? What is a good project? What's a bad one? It is such questions that need to be seen as part of ongoing processes of evaluation operating along existing imperatives, along existing norms, ideologies, rules, styles, uh, figures, texts, forms, images, and so on. They regulate our understanding and our appraisal of architecture, as well as the extent to which we take into account its different histories, its stakeholders, its beneficiaries, and its many casualties. So it is these processes of valuation and valorization that we need to get our heads around and that we need to intervene in very carefully to fully articulate a theory of architecture that is suited to engagement with the changing realities now and in the near future. Now, since there was good news, there's also bad news. Bad news is that unfortunately there is no automatic mechanism for the work that lies ahead of us and that could provide us with the right theory at the right time. So we will need to do a lot of roadwork ourselves here in order to access and assess and redefine the criteria that play a critical role in shaping, institutionalizing and disseminating such architectural theories. But what we know is that today processes of knowledge production increasingly in sync with the production and accumulation of financial values. And so one of the, our first tasks here will be to look at the models, to look at the instruments and representations that equip financialized evaluation with the protean character of its material manifestation. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do today. And in doing so, I want to turn to contemporary forms of city making as the site of investigation, as I think this is a site that best demonstrates how architecture's capacity to both signify and materialize the production of value is currently being enlisted in the creation of new geographies of investment. And it is these patterns of urbanization that I've been investigating as well over the past few years together with Helgi Mosheimer uh, in a project that we call Building Capital. And the work that we're doing in this respect um, has to do with the close relationship between space and economy, architecture and capital, and of course and that's nothing new, one could say, because it's intrinsically linked to the development of modernity, to its economic rationalities and methodologies. You can see that by the mid-19th century, industrialization in Europe 
had catalyzed entirely new economic structures that led to the transformation of major cities. And we see Vienna up here, we see Paris, but this one could also think of St. Dallas, Barcelona, and, and so forth. And there's another moment in this uh, history, the early 20th uh, century, when a similar expansive aspect uh, could be seen in the design of such entrepreneurial outposts. Uh, here we see Henry Ford's German city for the land here in the Amazon region. Uh, and then the series goes on in the desire for suburban life in the mid 20th century that created a boom in commodity production, consumption model that has then, of course, successfully been exported and copied around the world. And what's important for us is that the consumer pattern of investment in the built environment has been circulated through property markets and urban developments, which we can see here uh, highlighted in, in uh, color. Now, it's these developments that have seen urbanism become a key economic engine. This has, of course, become particularly evident in Dubai's particular style of speculative urbanism. This is kind of urbanism which we are seeing today in many different places around the world. Uh, and my proposition here is that this <coughs> spread of a particular kind of urbanism, not just simply an effect of global finance capitalism, but if you want to understand the mechanisms that are um, operating here, then we need to also understand that it's about the means by which finance is strategically and constantly inscribed into local territories. Because what I think is foreground in this process is the built environment not as a container for the production of commodities. It's about the production of the city as a commodity. This shift helps us perhaps to explain the ongoing changes that we, that we are currently seeing in cities around the world. The shift from sites of production and habitation to asset portfolios, from speculation with spatial production to spatial production for speculation. And Dubai, of course, is perhaps one of the most obvious cases in the showing testimony to the global power of real estate speculation to find any kind, as it seems, any kind of financial downturn. But one of the most dramatic instances illustrating the urban consequences of spatial production for speculation is a, a perhaps lesser known uh, development in Dubai's mm -hmm. smaller city in Ajman, which is a neighboring, neighboring Emirates, I should say. The Emirates city is a development that, that uh, has been built just before the financial downturn, before the financial crisis started to happen. Unlike many developments in downtown Dubai, Emirates City fell victim to this global financial collapse of 2008 when mortgage flows uh, needed for its completion eventually dried up. The master plan of Emirates City envisaged the construction of around 70 such residential towers bearing evocative names such as Paradise Lake Towers, Gold Crest Dreams, Fortune Residence Towers, and so on. But the work on the site commenced, as I said, only a few months before the onset of the global financial crisis and was soon, soon halted thereafter. So only a handful of towers were cut out, and probably it's, it's just these that we see here in this image, and most were then the target. Now, the, the problem here is that the towers are located in the middle of nowhere, a place that, that has a density uh, that rivals Asian cities such as Hong Kong and Singapore. Nevertheless, these land apartment floors sitting on top of some kind of multi level parking structure, which is why these, these towers are typically referred to as podium towers, they manage to be sold off plan as free floating commodities by in terms of unit numbers and proposed amenities. And the, the plenty of such really nice amenities that have been proposed, like great pictures, lakes, uh, parks, lavish shopping facilities, mosques, five star hotels, and, and so on. So, although several towers have now been completed and work on other towers have slowly picked up, what we're seeing here is that a pattern is emerging. A pattern that echoes the dynamics of many other international investment hubs. While successfully branded, urban um, centers keep attracting global interest, it is such peripheral sites as Emirates City that are being left behind. 
Now, what I want to show you is here by contrast, other places, such as the Midlands and central Mumbai, they are really fast growing economic hubs. Here in the Midlands, it's thousands of luxury apartments in high rise towers that are currently under construction to replace the former working class neighborhoods of the Midlands. But the issue is, in order to morph into globally tradable commodities, such spatial products need to be made compatible with the demands of highly diverse markets across the world. And therefore, certain sky villas are being built on former slum sites, perched some 70 or 80 floors up in the sky. And these buildings, as it were, often extend over several thousand square meters and are equipped with special amenities such as uh, running tracks, infinity pools, urban forests, and some of these kind of sky villas even have their own pet spas. Now the physical distance that we see here of these multiple luxury apartments from the ground and the disconnection from concrete urban history is go hand in hand with the ongoing fragmentation and re-accumulation of urban space in tradable and scalable units. Everything here is geared towards the production of abstract exchange value and the trading of risk components. It's three out of ten of tourist residential skyscrapers, including one one which we see here, that are currently under construction in Mumbai. So three out of out of ten of the tourist residential skyscrapers. It shows how the abstraction of architectural spaces into investment vehicles relies on the creation of patterns that allow an exchange between different levels financial forwards, building industries, cultural settings, aesthetic frames. All of them anchored by international recognizable names such as Palais Royal, World One, Sky Living, Urban Forests, World Service, and so on. So, in a way, tradability is key to the value of such speculative architecture and has a deep impact on urban form. Now, in the case of Nine Elms, which is currently the largest urban regeneration zone in central London, this impact can be felt in many different ways. The zone which we see here comprises around 40 developments and it has become the playground for international developers. The Battersea Power Station, uh, one of perhaps the most uh, recognized buildings, as it were, in London, is the anchor point for the whole regeneration area. Bessie Power Station is owned by a Malaysian consortium of investors and is being transformed into homes, offices, shops and restaurants. Now the former symbol of 1930s and 50s uh, industrial expansion in Britain is now branded as an iconic living. And it of course includes all the amenities uh, that one can expect as an international investor or as an international buyer. <coughs> But the plan for an urban renaissance that was proposed uh, early on along the Thames, these plans are not going as well as expected, at least up until now. Some of the towers are barely occupied. If you walk around there, you can uh, indeed see that. And instead of the expected urban bus, there are only empty rooftop bars, there are empty clubs, empty cinemas, and hardly any people to be found in the areas. Uh, between the new built towers. Here's one of the most prominent buildings by uh, Richard Rogers, this high rise cluster uh, named River Light. Now, what would expect the development of such prominence and importance to the future identity of London of all places, to furnish the city with a major cultural institution, a cultural institution that provides both a sense of the local community, perhaps also a sense of community, a community that radiates and generates a more global audience, and in that way it lends the development the appearance of credibility. Instead, the development features a high security US embassy with a moat around it, something that commentators have said that it's the modern version of London's medieval tower. This sign has been determined by a series of cautionary measures 
that make sure no one can approach the building unsolicited, let alone launch any kind of physical attack on the building shelf. But still, the development of the site next to it, the Riverside development called Embassy Gardens, is full of praise for the cultural value of the Embassy building. And that might well be because what is at stake here, as for the developer, is the Instagram ability that we can see a point of it, such as here by this image, and the ways in which the, the, the building features on the platforms such as Instagram, uh, Pinterest, and, and similar, similar ones. Uh, so that is a particular aspect in which uh, visuals, imagery, along with promotional videos that are rolled out in the range of social media, have a lot about values and value generation uh, in this respect. Just another indication of what's happening here. The development features the world's only floating sky pool, which we can see here, but also beautiful landscape gardens, a distinguished private club, easy access to London City Airport, and so on. But, and that's the point I want to make, if we look at the development, we also consider that many of office spaces, retail space, but also many apartments are still city vacant. And it makes us think about the changes that are happening here. And my suggestion is that these changes are about the fact that conventional metrics no longer seem to apply in attracting new investment these days. That is because I think people are increasingly looking for the life of the city itself. That is to say, streets, its shops, its markets, its culture, and cool hangouts, rather than simply uh, high spec floor space. And so new types of city making are currently emerging uh, that have a better fit with a perhaps a millennial mindset. Now, of course, there's not enough time to talk about all of these different types of city making that I think are currently emerging as part of our, our research. So I, what I want to do is talk about just one of these types of city making, which I call a platform urbanism. But before I go into detail here, I want to show you at least several such types to give you a bit of a feeling for the diversity of different models that is these new patterns that are rolled out uh, in cities worldwide. And one such model uh, centers on uh, what we may be called incentivized zones of investment. There are several kinds of such zones, I think, uh, of opportunity zones, uh, disaster relief zones, free trade zones, and so forth. But together, these particular specialized zones constitute an urban paradigm that is based on granting investors major exemptions from existing rules or restrictions. Right? Could be fiscal exemptions, environmental ex exemptions, or constitutional exemptions. Uh, special economic zones, or free zones, as they're often called, a type of invest incentivized zone that has been introduced to architectural discourse, most notably, probably, by Kelly Easterling in her work on extra statecraft. And we see that in recent years, the development of such urban areas as themed free zones between China or Dubai has become not just a way in which, within you know, constrained per parameters, something is happening, but they have indeed become a key force uh, for building global crossroads of trade, finance, management, and quality. Now, by contrast, probably, crowdfunded urbanism is in a new financial arena of small scale investment that is fused with new paradigms of citizen engagement. Projects seeking to attract crowdfunding are often advertised as giving ordinary people, ordinary citizens, the opportunity to have their say in the design of their urban environment. So, you might indeed question what is they, what is we in this particular context? <coughs> Wrong examples include uh, pedestrian bridges, they include underground parks, floating pools, and many sort of fancy urban infrastructures that have been financed bottom up. And these schemes, especially in the last few years, have raised numerous questions, one of which in our context uh, is something that has to do with uh, the way in which they are intersecting with what we can expect. Uh, what the city should provide for its citizens. Many people have said, well, of course, uh, such schemes, once they become an increasing feature in our, in our cities, that will dramatically lower expectations of what cities themselves should provide for 
citizens of the first beings can happen bottom up as well. And then there are these container based villages that are located in particular sites of urban transformation. They are not all catch icons, as you can see here, but they are also ideal placeholders for whatever might be built in the future. And so we might say that if tents were the architectural weapons of global protest movements a couple of years ago, if you think of the Occupy movement, or if you think of the Arab Spring and the movement of the place and so forth, then it's these container villages that are probably uh, the Norwich economies, ten cities. This containerization of our cities serves as an important signifier for the power of creative disruption. It also provides plenty of opportunities, of course, for millennials uh, to indulge in the many different comforts of this sprawling makeshift culture. And perhaps if we look at the image and the containers that are beautifully stacked here, who wouldn't really enjoy this being a nice cappuccino or flat white in one of these stacked buildings? And uh, you know, be it here in the Lisbon's village underground, the one in uh, Dubai called Boxbau, uh, even in, in, in the desert, Master City, the epicenter of innovation has its own container. We would, be, we would have thought that. Now, a more stable but still temporary form of speculative value generation can be seen in the rapid rise of urban innovation hubs in cities around the world. Such entrepreneurial initiatives tend to occupy repurposed iconic buildings, including museums, warehouses, uh, there are train stations, or navy yards, hospitals, and even prisons, uh, especially in parts of the city that are deemed right for gentrification. Now, these architecture icons act as a kind of fixer upper canvas and the clusters of startup businesses that thrive on the urban potential of these locations. And uh, I want to point one, one particular really interesting uh, image here in this context. In Berlin, uh, perhaps you, you know this location uh, because it's the setting that Andrei Tarkovsky used in his 1970s uh, cult film Stalker, and is in turn the new creative hub for the city of Tallinn now. So, digital platforms. Uh, it brings me to, to uh, an emerging paradigm of city making now that uh, I do want to focus on a bit more here. It's to do with uh, what I have called, uh, called platform cities or platform urbanism. And uh, if you think of digital platforms, say Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Uber, or its California rival Lyft, which we see here, then digital platforms are first and foremost perhaps economic and technological constructs. But they are also a broader force that includes extra economic components, components such as trust, appreciation, shared assumptions, values, belief systems, social bonds, our well-being, our emotional affective attachment uh, to something. So components that are all dependent on architecture and design to realize their full potential. So when I talk about platform urbanism, then this refers to more than just instrumental use of new technologies in urban space. Right? The use of technologies in urban space is perhaps something that we often see reflected in the smart city concept and its promise of generating more efficient cities. Right? That's the use of technologies in urban space. But what I mean by platform urbanism is an entirely new paradigm of social organization. One that is anchored in beliefs around peer-to-peer -peer interaction, new forms of sharing and entrepreneurship, and for which urban space has become a key technology. In his book, The Stack, Benjamin Bratton has so aptly argued that what we are witnessing here is not a preconceived plan that is set in motion by new technology and then just rolled out across the world but what he calls an accidental megastructure. A megastructure that is responding to the neoliberal imperative of the city as platform. And the prime example of this is probably San Francisco, a city which has become home to one third of the world's biggest unicorns. 
unicorns and startup companies have valued at over one billion uh, US dollars. So one third of the world's biggest unicorns are currently located in San Francisco, making the city of San Francisco uh, outperform the really Silicon Valley as the global center for uh, global uh, venture capital. Now, if you think then about the role that technology enabled platforms play here, I think that they are key to how we are all enrolled in embracing the new paradigm and how we are developing ever new instruments of speculative urban uh, investment. It's cloud based software, it's social media, mobile applications, <coughs> and other technologies that enable us all to be part of the game there. And perhaps indeed, at first glance, everything seems fine because there's definitely some element of democratization with the, you know, the, the uh, um, extension of involvement to all, if not uh, to, to many, if not all of us. But then, if you think about what's happening here in many different levels, I want to give you just one example. It's through dedicated online platforms such as this one, or these one, I should rather say, that everybody is now called upon to act as a kind of investor. Everyone can be invested in, can be tasked with all kinds of challenges, and in return can herself or himself invest in everything that is up for speculation. Now, what we're seeing here is not one, but these are actually two different platforms. One is just a, a montage of, of two different uh, ends. While the one on top is a low-cost online investment platform for people who don't have the expertise or the time to run their own uh, investments, the platform below offers so-called human capital contracts, HCCs. This is a means of direct investment <coughs> in pools of talented people around the world, many of whom are university students actually, that are grouped according to their university status, they're grouped to, uh, in relation to perhaps their ethnicity, their nationality, and since we can both be at the top and at the bottom of this game, that's why I put these two different images to get together, what's happening is here that we are now all able to place bets not only on our own future, but we can place bets on each other's future. Uh, and we can do this by just one click. <coughs> so anyway, doing what these people seem to be doing is, has become as easy as buying a book on Amazon. So it's no longer just the work we undertake, our economic performance, but our entire lives that have become possibilities to invest in. And following this financial logic, the way we perform, that is to say, the way we live our lives, needs to be consequently tracked, measured, quantified, and recorded so that we can be held accountable for potential gains and losses. So this democratization of investment opportunities has serious side effects or consequences, I should rather say. One of the most far-reaching consequences is perhaps the fact that speculation is no longer just speculation. It has become a byword for taking care of our future. It has become an obligation, if you want, a moral imperative, the right way not to be egoistic and self-centered, but the right way to be social. Now, I think it may well be that today we don't respond to the same ideological calling that, for instance, Calvinists did back in the 16th century when the practice of business was, in their view, linked with a sense of religious responsibility. Or late in the 19th century, that's why Max Weber, the social organization, was starting to be entrenched in the idealism of early capitalist endeavors. Nevertheless, I'm convinced that the effects of today's calling are at least as powerful and they are as tangible in emerging forms of city making, which is what I'm going to focus on now. The current demand for flexible workspace is making co working spaces increasingly popular, resulting in fierce competition between platforms offering global networks of such facilities. The undisputed market leader in the sector today is WeWork, a platform company with a 20 billion US dollar valuation and more than 250,000 members in more than 70 cities worldwide. 
So what does 250,000 members mean? It means that there's a workforce of this number being supplied with rental space by this platform. But there's some slight irony involved in this, because oftentimes, if you have time to actually uh, follow this up, it's, it's, it's really worth it, uh, checking this on, online. Because there are several media interviews in which we were proposed to its customers, not just as customers, but often they talk about these 250,000 members as its employees or as its workforce. So it's WeWork's workforce. That's the, the, the kind of rhetoric that is being developed here. But what makes WeWork so attractive, obviously, it's, is its convenience and its immunities that are provided across a global network of WeWork buildings, including not only free drinks, beer and coffee, but photo studios that members can use for shoots, indoor gardens, an extensive range of workout equipment, and many, many more facilities. Now, Lately, WeWork has started to attract larger businesses, companies with more than 1,000 employees and WeWork's fastest growing segment. The result is bigger and bigger WeWork facilities than can accommodate an ever wider range of businesses. The biggest so far, perhaps some of you might have, have uh, seen the building group of work or in, in New York uh, lately, the biggest is Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's right at the epicenter of the innovation economy. The facility opened its door only a few months ago and it offers 5,000 guests for it. It occupies one of the largest developments in New York City to be built outside Manhattan in decades. The thing is, if you want to expand, like WeWork obviously does, if you want to expand, the knowledge is of course everything. And so constant conversation with the customers or with members of the workforce is one means of doing that. But knowledge about the habits and preferences of WeWork's workforce is also generated by using presence sensors in all buildings to track how people actually use the space. And WeWork maintains a research department that develops such devices to collect and analyze data, which is then used as a basis for generating new ideas. One of these ideas is we live. The company's recent attempt to fully integrate dwelling into the expanding WeWork empire. WeLive offers fully serviced flats with up to four bedrooms in high-risk buildings, such as the one that you see here, <coughs> including a range of communal spaces that are similar to such spaces that are found in student homes and student dormitory accommodation along with access to WeWork facilities next door. And we see here that the first five floors or so see in, in green here, this is WeWork, and on top there are many, many flows of WeLive. Now, these experiments with housing allow WeWork research, WeWork's research department to conduct detailed studies of friendship networks in WeLive space. That happens in a way that three, every three flows are grouped into a neighborhood, a neighborhood that shares common spaces. The question around which these studies then are structured is how this grouping into neighborhoods affects people's community ties. So drawing on a sample of people who pay a lot of money, I think it's a small uh, such a flat perhaps in, in, I think in New York it was around 3,000 US dollars a month. Uh, that was the minimum, that was the entry fee for uh, a month of we live in New York. A, a lot of money, as I said, to the infrastructure provider. It's a paper that can experiment in real space with new forms of social organization that make them. The leading force in challenging conventional paradigms of how we choose to live together in cities and how we are looked after by our elected governments. So this is not an encroachment on the self-determination of urban communities, but it's also an uncanny reminder of the virtues and imperatives of a historical period in which experiments with grouping members of society began to play an immensely important role in governing populations. If you look back to the period that fought the French Revolution, that is to say the early decades of the 19th century, many attempts were made to structure the development of early modern societies. These eras 
utopian socialists included Charles Fourier, a philosopher, writer, and perhaps in contemporary terms, an innovator, as we would say today, whose plan it was to rebuild society from the bottom up. Now, his recipe for doing so was a paradoxical mixture, a mix of precise calculation on the one hand and unlimited pleasure on the other hand. Fourier identified 12 different pleasures inherent in humans that would need to be combined in a strictly calculated manner to create ideal clusters of exactly 1,620 people. These people, these people would be housed in what he called funnel stairs. In these funnel stairs, which basically uh, look somewhat like uh, residential houses, Fouillet thought that natural passions would automatically unfold and lead to perfect social harmony. This is why late in the 20th century, several writers, including Hornbart, Walter Benjamin, and many others, have started to, you know, to integrate some of these ideas and react upon these ideas. And Walter Benjamin, in his Arcades, Arcades project in the Passage, uh, stated that Fouillet housed his land of cocaine, as he called it, Tantra Hafenland, in a reaction modification of the arcade. What's important in our context? is the fact that Fourier's calculation is motivated not by values such as justice, equity, or liberty, but by pleasure. So be as simple as fun and pleasure. That's the basic motivation behind the scheme. The key aim of the calculation is then to transform work into pleasure. What's more, in Fourier's world, pleasure is an exchange value that can be traded in for other values. So happiness both on a collective and an individual level, is an experience that can be calculated and can be purchased. In this sense, Fourier's theory uh, anticipated, probably, but the social graph pioneered by Facebook and other platform companies aims to achieve today the determination of the right matrix for future investment. Facebook and its social network are indeed the case in point here. The increased focus in Facebook groups as a unit of meaningful interaction on Facebook is less driven by economic valorization based on individual likes on individual pages and value generated by the entire social networks. But the new engine that drives the rhetoric of Facebook's idea of the global community is the formulation of a model of society based on meaningful social interaction and groups are the starting point for such a model. Much has been written, of course, about the future of life and work, fun and work on the corporate campuses of Facebook, Apple, Google and so forth, and the particular value systems they project in terms of design. The campus is a space of encounter and innovation, a feel good environment for an idealized community of knowledge workers who spend endless hours working on campus by being pampered with unlimited food and drink supply, with fitness studios, on site healthcare, social programs, entertainment, and so forth. And surely, Facebook's old Menlo campus, uh, one hack away, is far from ideal. The point where most visitors gather is here. So these visitors gather taking pictures of each other. And the place that I see here is hidden behind some rows of overgrown shrubs next to this busy uh, traffic uh, intersection, multi-lane traffic corridor, which makes it somewhat uh, challenging to enact, to reenact complicity with the company ethos. And then employees are picked up by a fleet of black buses from Facebook's private bus stops in San Francisco, softening the friction that exists here and that is created between, by, by the long distance commute to Menlo Park. And it does allow, of course, people on bus uh, to lose their time generating fresh ideas. The point here is that such frictions emerging in the production of value are then softened by architectural design. Silicon Valley has entered a phase in which a campus is start to be carefully curated by choosing the right architect who can project an image that is needed for both the company's employees and the outside world. The new campus built by Frank Gehry 
in the marshlands of Menlo Park includes ample open space, includes sighting tracks and elevated walkways that, by the way, have often been compared to New York's High Line. Now, the most recently opened extension of Menlo Park, also designed by Frank Gehry, uh, connects to the old campus by a central garden, and here we see tropical plants, we find flexible workspaces, a sort of town square, and restaurants, trees, and so everything you would wish to find in a decent city. So clearly the goal here is to create an atmosphere of vibrant urban life. A fiction required to address the peak millennial goal, which is happiness and a good life. Facebook aims to promote such happiness with a new scheme for a mixed-use village for its 30,000 employees called the Willow Campus. Here, Facebook will take on a more sovereign role than it has so far. Facebook plans to set its own policies to design village life from the bottom up, including housing provision, including transport infrastructure, services, and all kinds of regulations pertaining to social life. Brim Corliss is an architect, of course, skilled in realizing the fictions that have become a basic part of our platform structure, social vitality, and how they suggest that future cities are going to be a glorious cocktail of play, entertainment, relaxation, and fun. It is perhaps telling, though, if you, if you look at the, these images, that architecture itself, but basically any kind of architecture vision, is absent from such initial representations of this future environment. So another platform company in Silicon Valley has a very different approach to image management. Apple centers its activities on a high, high skillful mediation of ideas to such a degree that it's often difficult to tell fiction from reality when people talk and write about uh, Apple Park, which is Apple's gigantic new headquarters in Chicago, designed by Norman Foster. There appears to be no face to the outside world. Contact, no stimulation. Everything is meticulously crafted and designed, but all value seems to hinge on the perfection of mediation. This is something that can be witnessed by the way visitors are greeted by the well informed hosts and how they are interacted to look at the right things, at the right angle, the iPads that offer you a secret glimpse of the inside of Apple, uh, the Apple mothership. And thus the fuel platform is strategically positioned to fuel the desire or the gift shop that sells immaculately presented items that are only available on site here. It's a fine, fine image that again gives you uh, a glimpse of the building itself with Apple employees being transported into the building. And then there's Silicon Valley's mother of all tech companies. Google, a platform that in terms of image making aims to project the ideal of openness and playfulness, at least when it comes to its campus and its own mountain view. The company has expanded its headquarters several times uh, in the same neighborhood. Here are several relics, if you want, from earlier, perhaps more innocent time, when a shaded area with these super sized figurines was all that was needed to create an immersive visitor experience. And when we walk across the old Google campus, we get a feeling that it's first and foremost the vision to provide an enjoyable work and leisure environment with ample open space for its employees as well as the odd visitor or perhaps a neighbor. But the site for new Google headquarters next to the current site, designed by Thomas Hathaway and Bjarke Ingels, will radically advance the old idea of the campus. Their design focuses not on the idea of environment for knowledge workers, but on curating the diversity and liveliness you find in an urban neighborhood. In fact, the ambition here is to design an urban neighborhood around the Google ethos. The prototypes, perhaps, of a functioning urban quarter, slightly more homogenous than a real neighborhood, slightly less uh, grand, uh, more and more strict, I should say, in scale. But a neighborhood it is. A neighborhood that is full of wildflower meadows, bicycle paths, yoga classes, pop-up entertainment, fountains, and lots of nature trees. So the 
the core of the design here is a dream of ultimate flexibility with architecture as a software that can be updated anytime on demand. And of course, given the scale of these ambitious schemes, it's no surprise the design has been compared to many visionary designs of the recent or distant past. Buckminster like Fuller's GTC Dome perhaps proposed to cover Manhattan, or Richard Rogers proposed for a swooping glass canopy to enclose London's South Bank. The design's modularity, as well as in many ways, reminiscent uh, of such schemes such as such as Price's Fun Palace, for instance, Archie Graham's Block in City, similar visionary plans in the mid 60s, aimed for unique adaptability and openness. But Google seems to be even more ambitious than that, as witnessed by Sidewalk Labs, which is Google's global innovation organization that will use Toronto as a testbed for developing communities from the internet up by using emerging technologies, materials, and processes. The company has already reached an agreement with Waterfront Toronto to plan Kayside, which is this uh, neighborhood here in Toronto's East Bay front area. The development is expected to cost some one billion US dollars, and it will be equipped with self-driving cars, machine learning, and many embedded sensors. Now, this is a dream come true for a company that's focusing on data. The dream of Endless, an endless stream of data from communities designed by Google itself. With sensors are constantly monitoring, recording almost all aspects of life. But the partnership between Google and the City of Toronto will not probably provide the blueprint for the terms and conditions for regulating such partnerships in other cities across the world. <coughs> and already portions of cities are being snapped up by tech companies to implement their own kind of sovereignty. And it doesn't really stop here. The real game is about mobilizing the data capital that's generated through urbanization for building and advancing artificial intelligence that can then be fed into other plans for even more advanced urban schemes. So in this way, urban life and its continuous optimization becomes the pawn in the race between the world's most powerful platforms striving for market dominance. In such data-driven environments, a personal data is not only mined and exploited for the purposes of platform industry, that's the old story, but a key aspect of this development is the valorization of our individual performances as human subjects. Because as a result, access to these new cities is not only a question of say, individual wealth or one's class or social status, but it will also become a question of individual collateral that is based on one's own reputation. And consequently, these cities, of course, won't be open to all, they won't be open for many of us. If our social graph, let's say our social credit, if we're talking about collateral here, is not up to scratch, then access to these brave new worlds might be denied. This is why Jenny Morozov in a recent commentary for the Financial Times has pointed out that in our digital era, claiming that's right to sit in, and now you've been mentioning Aurelia uh, Zerbe in this context, also needs to include demands for a right to data. And this is a conversation that has started in, in some uh, fields of, of knowledge that from data. I think it's, it's really time that in, in order to be, we need to uh, get involved in this conversation uh, as well, and think about especially our architecture's capacity to materialize and signify the production of value in relation to, to these changes, how they can be enlisted in endeavors to create more equitable urban landscapes. And now, in wrapping this up here, I would like to give you a few, few examples uh, of what I think does lie beyond these dominant templates of architecture on demand. It's just a few examples really really of the search for alternatives that suggest perhaps other ways of doing architecture and alternative forms of knowledge generation and several ideas of how valorization could look like in a different way. Now, I want to start this with an anecdote about an experience that I had quite recently. For several years now I've served uh, as a uh, panel member as a chair for the Cost Association. 
cost association, cost association is uh, the oldest and probably one of the most um, well-known and established organizations funding European networking projects across all fields and sectors of knowledge production. And it's time, time and again during the panel meetings that we have in Brussels when we have discussions about proposals that have been submitted for funding that I've tried to explain to my colleagues that there's some kind of difference between the proposals coming from our architecture and other proposals. And I was trying to, kept trying to explain that uh, there are several problems for our industry in seeking support from the reviewers, for instance, who rarely come across parts based research. And I was explaining many, many other stumbling blocks that we are facing and that have an impact on the likelihood of proposals from within the arts and architecture of receiving funding. But all the people I talk to about this issue, they would just simply shrug their shoulders, ignoring the fact that not a single application, a single proposal that was arts based had been funded in the entire history of the cost program. And we're talking about decades in this instance. So what I did was when I was asked to serve as a panel chair. And I had to draft the final report for the scientific commission. I tried to make my point as clear as possible. What it did was I drew was the per almost perfect standard deviation curve formed by the allocation of points to proposals that look at the entire sample. Right? That's what we see here. And then I drew another line. This one showed the curve formed by the distribution of points to proposals from the arts and humanities. The green curve, over the difference. And then I drew another line. This one indicating the funding threshold and showing that it's only proposals on the right side of the line that receive funding. And then I showed this diagram to people around me and said, Oh, what a tragedy. There's something that there's definitely some wrong here. We need to address this issue. So, finally, as a result, the entire review process um, was refashioned this year to include several rounds, complex rounds of interaction between all parts involved applicants, reviewers, uh, panelists, uh, scientific officers, and so forth. And this change has now started to really bear fruit with the funding of the first cost action to be entirely arts driven. And it's an initiative that is about a practice like generation of knowledge for art and architecture can act as a leading voice, not just a contributor, but as a leading voice in developing a better understanding of the possibility of a proposal's called advanced practices. I'm telling this because I think it illustrates two points. First, that in architectural design, we don't need to accept that we have to work within narrowly defined parameters. The parameters can be challenged and sometimes they need to be challenged. Right? The second point is that within the field of architecture, whatever knowledge we are producing, be it as architecture theorists or as practitioners, rather than encrypting this knowledge so that no one can eventually understand what it is that you want to communicate and say and, and talk about, we need to be as clear as possible when communicating ideas and communicating our concerns. And I'm quite optimistic in this respect as there are many new developments that demonstrate that indeed there's something happening here. And just these are the last uh, five slides that I'm going to show you. It's a couple of practices that I'm uh, they're, they're really close collaborators and friends. Here's Atelier d'Architecture au de Chore, which is a well known uh, Paris based practice that is part of uh, what one could term an eco urbanism to urban planning. They engage with issues of resilient cities, uh, involve different stakeholders in project work, um, including building the worst inclusive communities, and much of the work that they're doing is of course a uh, quite long-term perspective. Then there's Teddy Cruz and Von Foreman uh, who propose using the US uh, Mexican border region as a site of urban and political experimentation. They think that from this uh, kind, kind of involvement in a, in, a, in a region that a more inclusive public imaginary might emerge. So that work radically rethinks our concept of uh, citizenship, migration, the fluidity of the border, and in this instance, 
which, which is, by the way, uh, actually currently being shown at the Venice Biennale, which is, I think, closing next week, if I'm not mistaken. So if you haven't been there, this is the last ch chance to, to, to see uh, on, on, on science. It's about, to, to, to talk to the that we're seeing here, it's about uh, the system of watersheds, financial watersheds, that they propose as the more relevant framework for the region and the, the ever strong uh, and currently the, uh, built uh, US border wall. In another practice that aims to highlight transformations generated by global movement and new forms of citizenship that such movement uh, necessitates rural urban framework. In this case, it's the movement from uh, rural areas to cities, which is creating entirely new needs uh, for new infrastructure to support uh, remaining rural populations. That is a work by practice that I think I want to introduce in, in this instance uh, with this audience. Uh, urban think tank work around uh, informed urbanism uh, and informal, of course, playing an increasingly important dominant role in terms of how we think about cities and how we think that in future uh, in future we will manage to, to create uh, interlinkages between formal and informal ways of organizing urban space. Uh, and last but not least, it's forensic architecture that has emerged as a way of using architecture as a tool to investigate processes and events that require some kind of clarification. Be it sites that have to do with war crimes, with human rights violations, and other such instances and tragedies, tragedies that are conceived in many different ways. Such projects, as we see here, testify only to the lack of common knowledge about such crises, but also to the necessity for critical architecture engagement in these situations. Now, last slide, my own position is, is really to stress the necessity to build sustainable hubs of research culture, uh, hubs that facilitate the relationship between theory and practice of architecture when that is not grounded, that's grounded not in theory, I should say, being subsumed to practice, but in the question, but in questioning, sorry, questioning the values that are underpinning various design operations. Right. So these are three points that I'm uh, working on at, at the moment and uh, that uh, will yeah, provide a site perhaps to offer more detailed uh, information about the things that I've only been addressing in a very sketchy manner today. To sum this up, to sum this up in, in just a few sentences, I think that cities today are in real danger of being turned into a playground for speculative operations. This changes to our value systems, and in particular the shift from cultural values to financialized valorization that are key to this transformation. In this current situation, I think that it is vital for architecture to define or to redefine its position. And it's in this respect that I think that future architects will face enormous responsibilities. It's because architecture is a powerful tool for structuring, for organizing, and for designing our environments. And we need to think that it's not despite, but it's cause of the impact that architecture has, that it can change things for the better. And theory, eventually, theory can be a guiding partner in embracing the many opportunities that we have. And so I'm very optimistic. Uh, turning in this note here, in light of architecture's long tradition of experimental and visionary design, that architectural theory and practice together can contribute a great deal to really introducing new values and to tackling some of the most pressing issues, probably, that we are facing today. Thank you. Questions? Um, I like, I mean, the ideas of community and the way that architecture influences the culture of communities, I think are really fascinating. Um, but I'm a bit wondering about some of the examples, uh, especially WeWork, Google, Facebook, so on and so forth. Their campuses notoriously generate communities. And they're, they're, that can be a positive thing. But those campuses generate communities that are designed to keep the employees working as long as possible, to monetize every hour of their existence. WeWork, you go to WeWork to work. 
and then you go next door to we live to live, and then you go back to we work to work, and you go to we live to live. They're communities, but isn't it kind of a problem that they're trying to juice every dollar out of you that they can with these communities? Yes. <laughs> that is, that's precisely what I was trying to say. The, the thing is, I, I guess that there's a slight difference though between. Do you need to use the mic? I think it's useful. I just can't speak on this. Otherwise, yeah, I, just, yeah. uh, I think there's a slight difference say, between uh, Canvas architectures, like what Google Canvas, Apple Can uh, Canvas, and, and so on, and urban environments that are currently being generated and rolled up in many different cities by uh, companies such as Weaver. And the difference is, and I think that's a, 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 a major mistake by some, if not many commentators who say that what is being, you know, what is being implemented on campus here with, with Apple, Google and so forth, that is a terrible uh, blueprint for how city life should look like. But it, it is, of course, in a way, but it is not the blueprint for city life. It is a canvas mm -hmm. for knowledge workers, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's the same sort so, so of mistake that, that critics have made when addressing issues to do with um, uh, you know, unruly incident, incidences, things that have, that have happened, uh, disorder, what happened, and, and you know, dirt, and you know. Uh, Situations to do with the camps of uh, occupation movements. People have often said, "Well, it's it's a, it's a, it's it's terrible. That is how future societies, how a living should look like." No, it's not. It's a tent city, and a campus is a campus. But what we work, with, we live. Another companies are currently doing. What Google is doing in Toronto with K-Side is producing real cities with real people and experimenting with. Them. Clearly uh, configured segments of populations. That's what we had. I think that's why we think of these two instances in the way that they indicate two, two different um, uh, two, two different forms of social concentration, if you wish, or social configuration. It comes to do with uh, how urban cities will look like with different forms of restrictions, ideal social. Uh, uh, Populations, social orientations, and the other is uh, a place that you go to to work and enjoy your leisure time as well. And uh, I think the, the more dangerous version, and that is something that we need to address really head on, is what's being proposed as a, a, a guidance structure, not just for people who are employed, because people living in, in the case that want only to include employees. But I think as forms of governments and sovereignty are spread across many different districts in the realm that we will definitely feel the impact of some new kinds of privatized forms of regulation and new forms of contractual citizenship that we, at the current moment, we will probably only uh, experience in a special city like charter cities. That is a, a, a model of city making that Paul Roma, the former um, World Bank chief economist has proposed from Juris, for instance, that's a highly privatized city. And bits and pieces of cities are then being, I think, uh, segregated from the realm currently by such platform companies, which is the most worrying uh, uh, development that we are currently seeing. Does this give an answer to your, your question? I, I think so. I guess I guess it wasn't quite clear if you if maybe it wasn't maybe it was an audio issue. But you, right. I couldn't quite tell if you were advocating for no. these kinds of weird totalitarian environments. <laughs> <laughs> no, just to make clear, like, you know, not endorsing uh, what, <laughs> what these platform companies are trying to achieve when transporting when, when translocating some of the ideas implemented in the urban world. Because the other thing is about how to govern urban population. That's why I was referring to. Years, some kind of 18th century, 19th century uh, model of how uh, you know ideal communities could be housed in the particular terms. Mm -hmm. yes. But we see very similar things going on now, and there are real issues because uh, no, but what is the striking difference? I think today in relation to some 18th century uh, uh, utopian scheme of 
some 1,620 people living together in four perfect sort of harmony. The difference today is that what we can do with data is precisely calculate these forms and we have immediate feedback of how certain configurations are played and learn run. So what we can then do is shape how communities should work and we can create the threshold of the ins and outs who has access to this, these new learned um, um, realms and who doesn't have access. That is the, the, uh, the, the, the point where we are, are going to be headed next. Who, who owns that data? Who, who owns the data? Uh, Google says, in, in, in the case of Trump, Google says that everything will be done uh, for the community. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the, the community's interest. Of course, they, 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 they really need to, 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 uh, to have some, some access to their app. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's a crucial question that we, that we need to ask who, ask who owns the data. Who has access to data? Who has the right to data? This is interesting. This will be the crucial question. I think that if we think about the gym, when you can think about the urban realm, that we need to come up with answers to how we share, how we implement, how we structure these realms of data, because otherwise it will be complex, it will be monopolies who will have, then have to say who has access to this data to the urban realm. Um, so I have a question. Um, maybe I don't know if it's uh, if it makes sense, but so um, if you look at the at history of the 20th century, uh, you 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 find a pattern of uh, you know technological disruption that suddenly uh, takes architecture and urbanism to a particular direction. So right now I'm talking about the car industry. Uh, that shape the way the cities are, that shape uh, what the private sphere is, what the public sphere is, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, the same problem of monopoly, uh, of who benefits from that, and so on and so forth. And then the question is, um, you know, I, I, I don't want, you know, so of course there are differences, there are tremendous differences between making hardware and making, you know, knowledge-based economy. I don't want to uh, uh, talk about details of this right now. Uh, I'm rather interested in what you're proposing as a counter um, position uh, for, for, for architects. So essentially, if you look at the, the 20th century, there will be people who would play along with this thing. So they will design, you know, car CDs. They will design, uh, you know, buildings which are taking all this technological innovation into account. Or you would, you would have people who would operate on fringes making, you know, either taking a, a, a strategy of escapism, or, you know, ignoring the problem, making something that's completely irrelevant, uh, you know, or, and so on and so forth. And the, the, the set of examples that you, that you gave in the end of the lecture seems to be actually, you know, that's, that's my question. So, you know, so, so you think playing along with this is, so it, there, there's, a, there's a binary situation here. It's, it's pure evil, uh, and then those practices that you're, that you're mentioning are well, that, that's the only way out, or like what, you know, how do you because because actually, uh, you know, you're showing um, the U.S. Mexico border project, which is you know our project. It, it can never be implemented as such. It's a, it's a fiction. So it's essentially being like, well, sorry, we can't do anything about the evil of this world. But just make beautiful drawings. Then you know you're showing. Um, the, excuse me. Is also right. You know the forensic architecture, right? Uh, then you know what I'm getting at. Yes, yes. So we have we have this collection of amazing architectural features, you know, and, uh, and history. Yes. That was produced just by playing along. What do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, if you got the gist of it. I think that by but, but the five practices that I've shown, it's, it's a small sample. I'm not saying that this, they're not representative of a large sample. But the fact, the reason why I wanted to, to introduce them in this conversation is by way of saying that we need to address a much more fundamental dimension if we want to inflict any changes of this brutal force of how 
technology, the citizen can be changing. But we, the point of intersection, the point of our intervention, needs to address the values and the line of how cities are currently being shaped. And unless you, have, you understand and address <coughs> the situation of different values need to be introduced along issues that we do consider to be urgent and pressing, then there's not going to be much choice. Then we need to play along. But the point that we can make is that there are other questions that need to be raised. Questions about resilience, questions about justice, about uh, forensics. These questions need to be highlighted as new dimensions along which new values might be developed. So I think it's, it's really it's, it's early days. It's not these are uh, that kind of practice and then hmm, try to come in with another set of practice, good and bad ones. Now it's not these these it's a simple dichotomy that I wanted to introduce as that was a little bit misleading and confusing. But I wanted to introduce the possibilities for new kinds of urban practices, urban dialogues, urban engagement, both in theoretical terms and practical terms, that could be launched when you reconsider the values that are in the underpinning of the current operation of urban frameworks. That is why I've introduced these kind of different practice. And I'm sure that the dissatisfaction perhaps comes because they are not providing you know, the answer to, to, to the question that you are just posing. But I think there might be a starting point to have this conversation and think about what we can build in the future. Well, I, I guess I was trying to maybe speculate about, you know, would say maybe revisiting the operaismo or like, you know, strategy of, of, of being like, okay, so why don't we just go inside of this thing and, but then, you know, starting pulling things from within rather than, just, you know, trying to step out of it and be, you know, essentially, well, forgotten for the sake of, you know, for the fact that, there, you know, like architecture is unfortunately one of those, those places where uh, capital is, is necessary. So, I think that, yes, uh, yeah, I agree with, with I'm here with such as, I think many of these, these practices, even they, they, they are not precisely doing what you, you are know, reflecting back now, because I think that we're unafraid by engaging you know, in, in rural areas, uh, the, the, the designs, they, they are there. It's a, it's a driving dimension in these landscapes, as well as with, with uh, the idea of the they, they are directly involved in, in uh, the urban dimension. But there's one thing, and then perhaps that's, that's uh, Connected to your question is that when I'm meeting with these, these people, we have an ongoing conversation, then what, every time one, one uh, uh, notion comes up like that is to do with scale. How to think about scale in terms of our dimension. I think that, that is something you, you were hinting at. That how, how to scale up you know, our ideas, how to really address the uh, uh, as it were. And perhaps I don't know, maybe you could think of other instances. Uh, and, um, I'm not sure if you have the right answer now. Uh, you know, we, as practitioners, as, as thinkers, as theorists, I'm not sure whether we have the, the right answer to what you're suggesting needs to be addressed. But I'm, I'm completely agreeing with you that uh, thinking about uh, dimensions such as uh, a new kind of uh, monumentalism, which is something that we need to address in architecture. How that could be brought into our uh, thinking without you know, being, being uh, exposed to a discourse of monumentality that we, we want to avoid. But there's something that we look at, for instance, that monumentality comes up, not in terms of monumental you know, justice or buildings, but monumentality to do with a change in systems in which we, we, we need to reflect the urban environment back. Uh, to, you know, to societies and how we could intervene in a much more systematic manner. I think systematic uh, strategies with long term and such variables is something that we've, we've completely lost in the way which we have been addressing the urban world in, in recent years. that um, on the one hand there, there is um, kind of a simulation of urban life going on within the campuses in order um, to create some 
I think uh, I just actually read it today. It's an old course series. It's kind of whole ideology of, of how we manage those businesses and kind of um, simulate some sort of urbanity in order for um, you know ideas to evolve and kind of new things to come up. Um, and I was wondering. Um, and probably just having in mind that the first image is all about kind of the interior, the exterior of data or knowledge. Um, what if kind of this, this Google Toronto um, thing, what if they actually build a city where every kind of traditional notion of urbanity, like meaning um, Accidental encounters, you know, years by you know, accidents, I think that it's basically impossible because they seem to know then everything and everything is kind of predicted. Will this kind of next step when they, you know, in some utopian view, if, if, if this came up to city level, will that probably mean the end of, of, of those companies because the great surrounding environment thing is kind of homogeneous and predictable. Of course, it also would be a night, you know, nightmare fantasies. It would be a really good fantasies about you know, us being constantly uh, not only uh, monitored and uh, managed, but also being programmed. And you know, there, there's a lot of uh, literature and so many films that deal with these aspects of how we project this scenario. Developments into the future. I think it might eventually happen. But the, the, the question is, I'm not sure whether the question was whether there is some core of a system that would never be incorporated into a uh, clear calculation. That was very either this or if you kind of observe some strategy to integrate you know, irrationality and kind of. Um, Get um, in such an order of to make the urban life, urban realm feel more alive, is it? Yes. <laughs> more accidental. Yeah. To plan in the uh, accidental car crash. Yeah. Exactly. Driverless <laughs> cars. Well, yeah. Exactly. Well, that's that's what this is. Well, it's not just the malfunctioning of the system, but it's being part of the system. Mm -hmm. I I have one question about the dynamics. <clears throat> Um, and I was wondering because I, maybe I just now thought maybe this is why this way the short is one short in this reset and um, the artistic research financing. So so maybe and my colleague said that which army is doing that? Do we work from within the system or against the system? We can build up in opposition. So maybe 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 the idea would be that there is because I guess this is where you address the kind of the institutions that we could be the allies of architecture and production. But then how do we get to this? Will we then will we can maybe either try to tie into the system or just change the regulations how the system operates at the moment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, needs to be I think we provided a rather mm -hmm. pivotal point mm -hmm. in which architecture can be uh, mm -hmm. used for creating something that's, that is mm -hmm. benefiting real money, but it can be extremely mm -hmm. So that's, that's the breadth of possibilities that are there. And they are there because of the possibility generated by new fabrics that are you know, configured through um, for lack of a different word, it's what the Benjamin Bratt has called the stack, the complex operating system that includes so many different complex layers in which we are meshed in a different, 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 difficult manner. But because, you uh, know, with, with the, 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 the research activities, with everything we do, basically everything we thought that we invest in something, we do have access to some kind of change. And that's, that's the, the positive thought. That's why I'm quite optimistic that if we get some, some kind of uh, fundamental layer that allows us to operate new ideas against different kind of value systems, 
then it might be possible to extract much more beneficial developments from this than, than you might see it without addressing these bottom layers of how, how environments are being structured and taken out and crafted. And there's this reality out there that we can never influence because we need to accept realities as it were, because that's this that kind of thing. So I think we, that's why I wanted to really stress that there's a positive message, despite you know, the, the dire complexities that we've seen, don't get me wrong. I do want to stress that there is a lot of optimism. I think that we need to dig much deeper than just on the, the addressing issues at surface, and so speaking of the at surface uh, by the Thank you very much for being with us today.